Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Komla Domelevo. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, yes. from University of Würzburg, uh, German, the Germany. And he will talk, and here is another guest, Journey, Operators with Metrics Weight. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for organizing the week and uh, giving, giving me this opportunity to, to present this work. So um, I'm going to discuss those journey operators with matrix weights. This is a collaboration with uh, Spiridon, uh, Kakarumpas, and uh, Odi Soler Igibert, uh, who are both postdocs with Stephanie Petermichel Peter here in the University of Würzburg. And um, it will be an opportunity to um, to discuss um, the the um, the use of BMO uh, in uh, this business of uh, journey operators. So <clears throat> I will give a brief introduction, some preliminary uh, results and main results, and some elements of, of proof uh, for those uh, weighted estimates. And uh, I want to spend some time on point four to discuss the probability uh, viewpoint and uh, this uh, H1 BMO duality uh, that has been uh, studied by Alain Bernard uh, in the late 70s. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, what, is, um, what uh, is it about? We want to estimate operators of calderon zygmunt type. So CZO here is calderon zygmunt So those are singular operators, so typically the Hilbert transform, as you know, or uh, convolution with other kernels. Uh, so in one parameter or one variable, um, we may ask the question, uh, what is the norm of those operators, of those calderon zygmunt operators, uh, in uh, weighted LP spaces? And so in particular, for a given weight, uh, to be defined, uh, so the the weight so the weight is of course uh, the function uh, that we want to use here uh, to integrate the the the, the, the LP norm. Um, so we want to know in which conditions on the weight there exists a constant depending on the weight, so that this operator is bounded. So uh, so this has applications to PDE and uh, is in. Interesting uh, in its own. And uh, this uh, question was answered by Robert Petherman in the 80s in a series of uh, very important works. And uh, it is uh, known that uh, this operator is bounded if and only if the weight obeys a certain, is in a certain class called the AP class which is characterized by the finiteness of a certain number that is called the characteristic uh, of the weights, we will see some examples later. So uh, <clears throat> what now with matrix weights? So uh, matrix weights uh, implicitly means that we are not dealing with a scalar function, but a vector of functions. So F is a function in RD with uh, real or scalar values. And um, uh, the uh, question at hand for one of the first works in that direction was regarding the Hilbert transform so here, this Hilbert transform uh, acts uh, co component-wise. So HF is the vector with each component, the Hilbert transform of the corresponding component. And um, <clears throat> the question is, is this quantity bounded uh, with a matrix weight? So W is a matrix, which is a positive matrix. So basically, we have a quadratic form here. <clears throat> And we want to answer this question. And this was answered. So you see those are, this is called the A2 theory because these are L2, uh, L2 uh, weighted spaces. Uh, was answered by uh, Trail and Volberg and technology developed for the study of those in this paper. Um, and um, it had applications for the study of uh, stationary processes. Uh, so you, you can compare the, uh, 
this quantity here involving the operator norm. Uh, so whatever we operator norm we, we choose for this uh, for those matrices uh, to the scalar case where the exponents are uh, differently distributed. But uh, it reduces, of course, to the scalar case. Um, uh, in the case of a, where W is a, mat, is a scalar. So <clears throat> it is a quite uh, striking that for the vector case with matrix weights, uh, the uh, optimal bound of the boundedness of the, of the Hilbert transform in those weighted spaces is not known. So it's not known in particular if it's linear here uh, in this A2 characteristic. Whereas we know that for the scalar case, uh, uh, this is a linear exponent. It's um, a result from uh, Stephanie Peter Michel. And so in the uh, vector case, there are a series uh, of results for the Hilbert transform or for general Calderon Zygmunt operators, relatively recent. And uh, uh, there is one operator, namely the square function. Uh, for which it is known that uh, uh, this bound happens with a linear dependence on the uh, on the function. So I'm just uh, noticing here that I'm using my pen here to 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 use the laser, but you don't see it. So uh, maybe I should. Okay. Oh, oh, that's there is something very. Uh, very strange here. I do not, when I write with my pen, I do not see it uh, appearing here. We so, did see it before, but not now. Ah, okay. So what's new here? Okay. You did see my laser beam before? Before, yes, in the previous few pages. Okay. Okay. Ah, oh, there is a, okay. My, 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 um, my sharing, uh, is uh, frozen somehow. So when I'm, oh, sorry, okay, okay, okay. Okay, here we go, here we go. <laughs> okay, back to business. I just unplugged the cable. There is some magic happening here with the technology. So, um, okay, so the question at hand here and, uh, is about uh, weight and there were th further developments by uh, many, many contributors to the AP theory in the 90s. Uh, and um, uh, okay, by 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 many uh, harmonic analysts. So um, I'm going to first introduce some a few notations about the house system that Sandra uh, mentioned uh, yesterday and uh, uh, at different occasions. Uh, you've seen it. So we are going to consider uh, the standard half function. Okay, so this is, uh, this is this function on a dyadic interval i, uh, correctly normalized with L2 norm equal one. And also we will note uh, with the index one here, the non-cancellative R function, which is simply the characteristic function uh, normalized also. So uh, in all what follows, zero uh, will refer to something cancellative, meaning a function with integral zero and one non-cancellative. So um, the dyadic uh, expansion, so if we are in R, we know that any L2 function has this dyadic decomposition and here F sub I here is a short cut for uh, the uh, half coefficient associated with uh, HI. So those form a, a normal base in L2. And uh, if we uh, start uh, on uh, I0, so not the whole R, but uh, given interval, then uh, in this decomposition, there is a first contribution. And this is nothing but the average of F uh, on I0. So the average of F on I0, I will also note with parentheses like this. So one remark that I will uh, uh, detail later is this is a one parameter martingale. Okay, I mean, those two objects uh, on different uh, spaces are martingales. So um, later we are going to mention para products. Uh, Sandra mentioned those para products yesterday. And uh, those para products uh, in the proof that I will present um, later, they are 
uh, distinction different methods employed whether we are dealing with a para product or a cancellative term. And already here, uh, if we think of this uh, product uh, for any point X, so this is a pointwise formula, it's, it's true for any point X. Uh, this is, um, uh, this is the product that Sandra wrote yesterday. And you see that it involves here two power coefficients of F and G, whereas here it involves the average of J on the interval I times the uh, coefficient, the half coefficient of F. So one, uh, so again, the superscript zero means that uh, it is uh, F, Uh, sc uh, scalar product with a cancellative power function, so the standard power function, and the index one refers to an average. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so this is actually an Ito formula in uh, probabilistic language, uh, similar to this Ito formula, uh, general Ito formula for the product of two, um, two uh, semi martingales. Okay, so. Um, why am I writing this? Because the para products or something looking, I mean, some para products here in one parameter uh, appear if we, for example, integrate over a kernel K, so with quotes, this function, this product. So if we integrate this product, we take the previous formula and we integrate each of those terms. So those deliver some coefficients. So we call them A. And then we see that we have uh, those three terms that we can uh, express again. So those are scalar, uh, scalar quantities that we can express as the uh, scalar product between a function times the test function G. And here, uh, when we have two cancellative contributions. So the cancellative coefficient of F times the cancellative half function, we call it a cancellative term. And here we have the uh, cancellative coefficient of F. So the half coefficient of F simply times the characteristic function of the interval I, this is a para product. And this is again, another para product where this time the average is on F and the cancellative term is uh, on the half function here. So <laughs> when we uh, go uh, in uh, two parameters, so we have again, uh, 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 we are now on the product space. So let's do it on R cross R, but it could be on uh, Rn cross Rm. Uh, then the half functions on the product spaces are just the tensor product of the, uh, of the functions here. So it should be X1 here everywhere or X2. And we note again the standard two parameter uh, half coefficient, so cancellative, we, uh, 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 we call it HR. And R here is a rectangle, a diadic rectangle. So we have again that for any L2 function, we have this decomposition as a sum of uh, half coefficients of F times HR. And this is a two parameter martingale uh, as we will uh, describe uh, later. So uh, <coughs> I'm insisting on this uh, martingale uh, language because uh, the H1 BM duality when written with stochastic language is uh, the same whether we are dealing with one parameter martingale, so say uh, problems on the disk, or two parameter martingale, so problems on the product space or on the by disk, or any number of parameters. Okay, so um, this is what we uh, want to discuss. And regarding the uh, matrix weights, journey operators are generalization of Calderon Zygmunt operators for uh, several parameters. So uh, uh, they are defined by a kernel that has uh, suitable cancellation growth and regularity conditions. And uh, as an example, uh, the Hilbert transform in the first variable 
and the Hilbert transform in the uh, second variable successively applied to a function uh, f of two variables is a journée uh, operator. And we say that the journée operator is para product free if <coughs> when we uh, freeze, uh, when one uh, of the two functions in the tensor product is constant, it delivers uh, zero. So it delivers zero on the uh, functions that are constant in one parameter at least. So <laughs> in order to study those uh, journey operators, there is a decomposition that relates any journey operator to hard shifts. And so this is why we want to, uh, uh, um, to uh, we are using this HAR system to represent a general journey operator. So what is a hard shift? <clears throat> we have one parameter, a hard shift that uh, Sandra mentioned also yesterday, is the operator which to a function hi, so that was hi, uh, associates uh, the difference of the two hard function on the uh, sub intervals. So it means that uh, here, for example, we would have this function here. Uh, with the correct normalization. So this is the, uh, the hard shift of complexity one. And it is known to represent, it's a result of Stephanie Peter Michel, uh, to represent when correctly averaged, the Hilbert transform, uh, which is a particular calderon Zygmunt operator, okay? And uh, now a hard shift of complexity uh, so this are shift of complexity one, we can rewrite it like this as uh, the sum over i times uh, of the sum of the all interval j, which are children of first generation. So children of first generation means that if i is here, we are looking at the generation in the DIDIC system uh, the first generation. So these, those are exactly the intervals I plus and I minus. So this sum just means I plus and I minus uh, are uh, appearing here uh, as the definition uh, says. Now, <clears throat> when we have two, uh, when we are with two parameters, uh, we uh, are also going to introduce some R shifts of complexity i, j, where both uh, indices i and j are themselves double indices. So uh, <clears throat> why is this? We consider here a diadic rectangle. So say r is a diadic rectangle. And so it has uh, two, uh, it, it is composed, it is the cross product of one rectangle in the first direction and one rectangle in the second direction, R1 and R2. And <clears throat> here for P, we consider all sub rectangles of R such that uh, they are uh, uh, belonging to the I1 uh, descendants, generation descendants of R1 and I2. Uh, of R2. So for example, if we start with R here, and if I1 is equal to, uh, to 1, it means that we look in the first parameter only at the next generation. So we cut the interval into two. And if in I2, the generation is two, for example, then it means that we go two generations down, which means we are dealing with four intervals here. So those would be all the intervals P that are children uh, with these uh, indices of R and similarly to Q, with Q. So uh, this is um, called a hard shift with a given complexity in two parameters. So the interest of those uh, shifts is that, first of all, they are relatively simple objects and uh, uh, it is a Martikainen result that in two parameters, you can represent uh, uh, arbitrary journey operators as, so in the weak form here, as a sum involving those hard shifts plus some exponential decay 
plus here some randomization of the dia degree. So this randomization is necessary to, 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 to get rid of the, of the artifacts of the dia degree as compared to, 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 to R or R2 to a continuous space. And the coefficients that appear here in those uh, shifts are uh, bounded by, uh, by the parameters uh, of the, uh, of the given by the shifts. So <clears throat> one more comment. When the journey operator is para product, product free, what we detailed, uh, what we defined earlier, then in this representation, one can show, one can choose only uh, cancellative uh, hard shifts. And otherwise, it will involve para products in the same, uh, of the same way as the one we saw in the Ito, Ito formula. So there is something I didn't say here regarding the Ito formula. Namely, uh, uh, we call this term para products because, uh, I don't know if I said it, uh, because we have always a pairing of a zero and a one or a one or a zero, meaning two indices uh, that are uh, the complement of each other. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is uh, what makes it a para product in in this uh, language. So we are able to prove <clears throat> that in the case uh, in the case where t is cancellative, and we have one weight. So I will only talk about p equal two here. Then <laughs> we have a weighted bound for uh, this operator. If we have two weights, we have also some bounds, but <clears throat> I'm not going to, to insist uh, on this. And uh, again, uh, for the non-cancellative term, with one weight or two weights, we again have some uh, boundedness with respect to some characteristics of the weights. So here, those exponents are certainly not optimal. So we do not look for optimality here, but it is a first result that delivers uh, a boundedness according to the characteristic. So <clears throat> for the non-cancellative case, we do not have a similar bounds for P different from two, only for the cancellative case. And so this is because we, 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 we lack some uh, weighted estimates for uh, strong maximal functions, for weighted strong maximal uh, functions. So there is a blocker here in our method of proof. So <laughs> uh, we have actually two methods of proof. There is a first method, so always using Martikainen representation, that uses a sparse domination. So um, uh, with uh, in the spirit of uh, Baron Pfeiffer, uh, two o seventeen. Um, and uh, this path domination uh, states that an operator of this, uh, our, of this type can be bounded by a constant time a sum of some square functions paired with G. Um, is, so excuse me here, I have to put it. Uh, so that would be uh, such an estimate. And so uh, those square functions here, uh, the sum here would not be would not be on all rectangles, but only on a sparse family of, of rectangles. So sparse meaning uh, a family of rectangles with a uh, few intersections. Okay. So um, the second uh, proof that I will give a hint in a in a second. Uh, relies on a nice property of dyadic shifts, meaning that they are transparent uh, to square functions. Okay, so they behave nicely, they interact uh, nicely with, that's the trick that was used uh, earlier uh, by Peter Michel and Pot. So, um, finally, what is a B-parameter matrix weight? The general, this, well, this is a definition, it is a generalization of the uh, one parameter case using some iterative uh, procedure where this would be the expression in one parameter and this uh, we integrate again to get the, 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 the two parameter expression. I'm not going to, 
to give more details about this uh, now. Okay, so those square functions, why are they interested, interesting uh, for us? Because uh, <laughs> uh, they, um, so they are defined like this. So this is the shifted square function. So uh, remember, we have two indices, i and uh, j. And so uh, we square the coefficients of f, and we square the uh, uh, we square the um, the half function q, which gives rise to uh, characteristic functions, and uh, okay, and this is what we what we obtain. So that's the definition. And with weights, those square functions with weights, we um, uh, introduce here uh, the little l two norm of those uh, vector valued function f. Uh, coefficients uh, with the uh, matrix weight that we have uh, at hand. Okay, so those are the definitions. And uh, uh, why are now the cancellative shifts and square functions interacting nicely? So let us start with the easiest shift. This is the shift of uh, uh, complexity zero. So a shift of complexity zero <coughs> means that HI gives HI, but possibly with a coefficient that we call sigma I. So this is simply a Martingale transform. And this is uh, uh, the square function of this Martingale transform. Uh, and obviously when we, uh, when we calculate uh, this object, only the diagonal term remains and the sigma j here, which is plus or minus one, uh, disappears. Uh, and so the square function pointwise is unchanged uh, by, a, uh, by a shift of complexity zero. And this is also true for the hash shift, for the classical hash shift, which is recalled here. So this is the hash shift in one parameter of complexity uh, one. Uh, and uh, we can, estimate again that this gives rise to two contributions involving the intervals that are uh, left intervals in the dyadic system. Uh, and here there is a plus missing. So here those, the second sum involves all dyadic intervals in the, uh, that are uh, right uh, children. And so the, the sum of those two intervals is the, uh, the uh, characteristic function of the parents with the correct denominator. So we recover pointwise the uh, uh, square function. So let's apply uh, this idea to a general uh, cancellative uh, term appearing in the uh, Martikainen decomposition. So this is Tij. <laughs> so first of all, it's possible to compare this uh, shift here with the square, with, with the weighted square functions. So uh, I will not detail this. And then we are left with this square function. Uh, and so this square function uh, now allows us to uh, get rid uh, of this uh, Tij. So uh, the reason, so this is the definition of the square function of this uh, shift. And uh, uh, this sum here of square uh, involves uh, all uh, cubes, uh, rectangular Q of the same generation um, here. And so we can factorize like we did before in a simpler case, uh, this term, and we obtain here up to a factor accounting for the, for the uh, depth of the shift. We recover here the expression of the uh, square function. Uh, apply to f directly. So the shift here uh, has dis disappeared and uh, we end up with now uh, uh, this object here, which we can again estimate by weighted estimate, the square function uh, is comparable to the uh, function itself. So uh, this finally yields uh, an est a weighted estimate for this small piece of the journey operator. And when we sum, uh, thanks to the properties of the, uh, the exponential decay, we have an estimate for the whole 
journey operator. So this is the idea for cancellative terms. And for non-cancellative terms, uh, uh, so I'm here writing only the non-cancellative terms, so the para products with, uh, with the lowest uh, shift, okay? Uh, so there are uh, those involved in the Marty Kanin representation, uh, those produced uh, by Marty Kanin's representation uh, have some uh, shift uh, with bigger complexity, but let's just look how the H1BM moduality uh, comes in. So these para products, for example, uh, we estimate uh, against the test function uh, G. So uh, this paired with G delivers the R coefficient of G and we have vector valued function. So this is just the scalar product. <laughs> and so what we can do here, we can write here uh, all those, all those uh, terms. We can write this as a characteristic function uh, of R divided by R and add an integration in dx. And this characteristic function is the product of two half functions. So if we distribute one half function on this term and one half function on, on this term, we have a, a, a scalar product in X in the variable X. We, di, we do Cauchy-Schwarz, so it's not, uh, so we do Cauchy-Schwarz uh, and we obtain here, and we obtain here the uh, uh, BMO norm of a, uh, uh, the corresponding function R A R H R, so the dyadic decomposition of uh, that I mentioned before, and something something similar for this term, and this is exactly the so the BMO norm of A, so this is the product BMO norm of A, uh, uh, and uh, here we have we recognize a square function type. Uh, object mixed with uh, a, a, a term that we can estimate. Uh, uh, excuse me, my screen is frozen again. Okay. Okay, so, uh, okay, so the term involving the function f here, as you can see, is involves the average of f. So uh, uh, this we can estimate thanks to a maximal function. Uh, always with weight, and the second term involves uh, square functions of uh, G. Uh, and finally, uh, so we can estimate all those terms, so uh, maximal function and square function in weighted spaces. So this gives the uh, final result. And the BMO norm of A is a bounded quantity thanks to the property uh, uh, of the uh, Terms in the Martin Kainen decomposition, so we can all those terms will add nicely and give uh, and give the final bound. So now my screen is frozen again. So um, so you so cannot go back and forth either. Uh, so I can on my iPad, but uh, it stops. So I'm gonna um, I'm going to uh, try. Okay, I'm going to try to see if it updates here. So, ah, okay, now you see, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, so in the uh, remaining time, I want to explain to, 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 to motivate why um, uh, the probabilistic viewpoint can be very interesting regarding this H1 uh, BMO uh, duality that is here presented in, uh, that was used here for in the dyadic system. So first of all, so martingales are, um, so do you see here? Yes. So martingales are uh, uh, stochastic processes. So they are indexed with a time t. So t, uh, well, t is the increasing, usual increasing time. Here we are with a natural number. So it's a discrete, uh, discrete process in time. Um, and um, so those uh, function, uh, at time t have to be uh, adapted to uh, 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 a sigma algebra ft. Uh, and the uh, property is that if we look at the average, at the expectation, so let's call it the average of the, our process at time t, 
and if uh, t is in the future of s, so if we look at the, at the average of all the values that are going to, to happen later, this average is equal to uh, the value uh, at the present time s uh, of consideration. So equivalently, it means that the increment between time s and t, so ft minus minus s, uh, minus fs, uh, averaged over uh, a set of fs is equal to uh, two zero. So those martingales, it is also a common, uh, common uh, thing to write it as a telescopic sum, where obviously uh, this increment is nothing but the, the difference between the two, two consecutive terms. And here I insist that this is for any omega. <laughs> so uh, a stopping time uh, is also a random variable <laughs> such that if we fix t a time, then the event that new the stopping time is equal to t. So this means uh, the set of all random uh, event omega such that the stopping time at omega is equal to t. This has to be measurable in ft. So why is this important? Because it makes uh, stopped martingales uh, 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 martingale. So a stopped martingale is simply the following. Given nu, so nu depends on, on omega. So a stopped martingale is not a frozen object. It's a, still a, a stochastic process from time equals zero to infinity. But it is a process such that uh, we freeze all increments starting a certain time. So the typical example is if we have a random walk, we can decide to stop it as soon as it reach a certain height. And then it continues. The increments are set to zero. So it's a constant function now. It's still, of course, a martingale. OK? So um, one parameter, diadic martingale, so the diadic decomposition that we wrote previously, we can write as a telescopic sum involving all values uh, uh, when we, uh, uh, all values uh, encountered, uh, on uh, all average values on the dyadic intervals that are above a point omega. So in the dyadic setting, the random space is the point X. So this is very important. Uh, and I'm going to, to illustrate uh, here. So we take uh, one omega, so let's say uh, omega, is here. And so omega is nothing but a point x. And in two parameters, it will be a, a point with two coordinates. So um, the, uh, to represent the stochastic process, uh, we look at all average values of f on all intervals uh, i. So this is the average value of x on an interval, uh, for example, of the generation number n of the adic interval. So n is the generation. So the time here goes down on this, uh, in this figure. Uh, so my, I hope my screen will wake up again. <coughs> um, and. Um, OK, and um, this trajectory here, uh, so let's say, OK, so I represent it like this. So what, uh, 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 OK, so this is the trajectory. Now, what is a stopping time? A stopping time has to be measurable, uh, uh, has, has to be measure, measurable with respect to the variable uh, with respect to the filtration at which the martingale is stopped. So this means simply that if, <clears throat> for example, the stopping time at that point is here in green, so the stopping time here is this n, so it means that this stopping time has to be measurable in fn, which means it has to be a piecewise constant on all diadic intervals 
of this generation. So the stopping time cannot be just, uh, if I represent it like this, cannot be just a chunk of a dyadic interval uh, of a given height. So it means that all the points that are in this interval here are stopped as the, at the same time as this point here. Okay, so a stopping time can be, for example, uh, this. So for example, like this, like this. So if I go here, I have to continue until here, then here. Uh, and for example, here, it goes here and here and then here. Okay, so a stopping time is a random function. So now we have in green a stopping time. It is indeed a function defined on the whole probability space, let's say the interval on the picture. And we have, uh, uh, we are going to be very interested in one, uh, uh, one quantity related to this stopping time is all this interval here, because this is the interval where the stopping time is less than infinity. Whereas uh, uh, here, on this set here, you see that we, we are here at the level of the real line. So here, on the contrary, the, the stopping time here is equal to infinity. OK? And so you see that on this picture, in the JD case, the uh, probability, let's say if the full interval is uh, of size 1, the probability that the stopping time is less than infinity is exactly the size of this interval uh, where this happens, OK? So uh, now, when we are in two parameters, uh, we are going to, 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 to consider just one trajectory here. So we are going to fix, I mean, the equivalent in two parameters of one trajectory. So here we had fixed a point x. So now we are going to fix a point x1, x2 in R2. <laughs> and we are going to wonder what is a two-parameter martingale. So it is a stochastic process, but uh, such as this how representation here in two parameter. But you see that the index R here, since the index R is R1 cross R2. So what is R1? It is uh, it is a uh, rectangle of a certain generation in the dyadic system. So there is a T1, a, a, a time that describes at which finest R1 is, and T2 also is the finest of R2. Okay, so this sum here can also be understood as a sum in two parameters, T1, T2, those are the times that I'm drawing now. So this here would be our time T2, and this here would be our time T1. And uh, 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 a two-parameter martingale has several properties. So one of those properties is that if we look, if we freeze one parameter, but look, for example, just at T1 increasing, then along those lines, the values that we uh, collect are random values, depending on, well, indexed by the random uh, uh, are random values, but uh, in one parameter. So my screen is, as usual, frozen. So I'm trying to refresh it. OK. So if this does not work, it's going to be, oh, OK, here it is. OK, so the horizontal line here is uh, a cut in this plane. And uh, we collect here a one parameter martingale. And of course, we can do the, 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 the similar thing in the other direction. We have also one parameter martingales in both directions. Now, <clears throat> the uh, important concept here uh, is what is the stopping time? So a stopping time in two parameters uh, is uh, not a time, but it is a line. So why is, why is it so? <clears throat> Uh, a stopping time, I will draw here uh, a stopping line. So this is new. So this is new of x. 
x is our random variable or omega. Uh, and so uh, what uh, we say here is the uh, following. In order to stop, uh, uh, to stop two parameter uh, martingales, uh, we have to consider lines instead of points. So for a very simple reason, namely that uh, 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 if we, uh, namely that the, 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 the time goes in two directions. So we can go here in this direction, in this direction. So a point is not enough to, to say whether or not we have crossed a certain threshold. And so uh, those are uh, such objects and those are always some decreasing some decreasing lines. So why so? Because uh, uh, if uh, such a stopping time would have, uh, um, would have, for example, here a horizontal uh, line, okay? Uh, it means that a rectangle here, that something happened here. Um, so, uh, well, maybe that's not very uh, clear. So I, I have to say something first. So the, when we look at one point, so let's look at this point, for example. Uh, this point has a past and a future. So the future of that point, since we are in R2, which is not a completely ordered set, this is the future of that point here. And the past of that point is the quantity that is here. So in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to make a clear cut between something early and something later, it's not enough to, uh, to, to look at one point. So one needs this whole line to define uh, correctly uh, uh, a two parameter uh, stopping time. So this lines, this line is what appears in the definition of product BMO. So let's uh, illustrate this uh, here. So if um, uh, we have, um, if we have here a domain omega, yeah, I have only a few minutes. Uh, <coughs> what is a stopping time? A stopping time in two parameter, we can say, uh, let's stop as soon as uh, uh, the rectangle at hand enters the domain omega. So we take a point X. So this is X is fixed. And we look at all the diadic rectangles that are above X. So for example, this is a diadic rectangle, but it is not included inside omega. So it will not be part of my stopping line. But now I have, for example, this one diadic rectangle that is maximal in omega regarding this inclusion. But of course, I can have a lot of such intervals. So all those intervals are not included in one another, of course, otherwise they would not be maximal. But you see that they are always uh, staggered like this, which means that uh, two different rectangles are always located. If one is here, the other one is in this quadrant here on the side. So this, why, this is what provides this uh, 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 stopping line that is decreasing. So all rectangles are incomparable with uh, each other. And so this produces this stopping line uh, above X. So, um, I have only, uh, well, a few seconds. So I will just uh, mention briefly that the, with this definition, the probabilistic uh, H1, so this is just the L1 norm of the square function, which is the sum of the square of the increments. And the BMO function in probabilistic language is nothing but the supremum of, over all possible stopping time of the square norm of F minus F stopped. So this is nothing but, so if this is a stopping time, we look at the function F here, all the increment square, and we take the sum. So we take the sum of this in this region, okay? And um, uh, we divide by the probability of the stopping time, which is, the size of the region. So for example, the region omega. So my, uh, 
screen is not refreshing as usual. Oops. Uh, um, uh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so, uh, uh, and this probability is nothing but, but uh, the set omega, for example, in the previous result. And so one can check that this probabilistic definition uh, co corresponds to the one we expect in the dialectic system in one parameter, as well as in two parameters. And uh, with this definition, uh, uh, I will not, I will stop here, but I will just say that there is a proof of Bernard in 79 uh, which uh, proves the H1 uh, BMO duality using an atomic decomposition for probabilistic object inspired by Pfefferman, by Charles Pfefferman, and uh, proves this H1 uh, BMO duality. So, um, okay, so this is what I wanted to say to motivate people to, to look at probabilistic objects, and I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can just either shout them out or you can try the chat. Any questions? Well, if not, then let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have eight minutes until the next talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I 